Let me know when you want to. Ready. Ready? Yeah. Okay, so good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are joining. Uh, today we have uh, Pavel Romanchuk from um, the Institute for Theoretical Biology in Hubble University in Berlin. Uh, he's going to talk to us about collective information processing in collective biological systems. So whenever you want, Pavel, you can take the lead. Thank you very much, by the way, for accepting the invitation. No, well, thank you for inviting me to give this talk. So um, welcome everyone, first of all. Um, so yeah, um, um, as my name is Pavel Romanchuk. I'm located in Berlin and head of an independent uh, so-called Eminuter research group. And the title of the group is actually Collective Information Processing, and this will be also the main talk or the main uh, content of my talk. Um, so my background is actually physics, um, and uh, but I moved over the years more and more into biology. And one reason for this was this beautiful examples of collective behavior that we see in the natural world. Starting from the smallest scales, uh, if you think of uh, bacteria coordinating the motion already at the micrometer scale, and moving up the scales to meters, up to larger swarms that we have um, actually in the natural world, which could which are local swarms can consist of millions of individuals and span of tens of kilometers in size and travel over continental length scales. And right now, um, um, some of you probably have heard that we have actually over the past months quite a, a problem with locals in uh, Eastern Africa, um, which is something which probably doesn't really enter the news that much uh, compared to, to other uh, current developments, but it's, uh, it's actually a, a huge problem for large parts of the world. And um, what fascinates me in particular um, is, first of all, if you come from physics, uh, you might be interested about this uh, um, complexity of the system and the self-organizing nature of the system. And you can ask whether there are any universal principles or laws that govern the macroscopic behavior of the systems um, despite the biological differences. So what, what could be the common features uh, of the self-organizing systems? Um, however, if you coming from the biological side, what I find particularly interesting or even more maybe interesting about the systems is that they just don't come together by, you know, simple uh, minimization of free energy, like, for example, uh, uh, fluid droplets or something like that, but they actually evolved over uh, long time scales to be collective. And because being collective serves actually a function, a biologic function, um, which benefits the individuals within the group. And one, you know, there are a lot of theories in biology why being in a group might be beneficial to individuals and why it might be evol evolutionary advantageous to be in a group. Uh, I like to summarize a lot of these benefits actually as um, the collective information processing. And in particular, if you think of predator avoidance, for example, uh, for a bird um, in the flock, it's actually uh, might be a single bird doesn't have to detect a predator. It may actually pay attention to the social information provided by others. In, and if they try to escape, it might be a good uh, hint that this focal bird should escape as well. Um, but you, what I'm particularly interested in my research is actually this interplay between the self-organizing nature of the systems, uh, basically through simple um, local interactions and also this biological function. Um, how do these two interplay, how they constrain each other and um, how they might sometimes even synergize to, to um, really work together. Um, let me, before I jump to an actual um, two topics that I wanted to talk about in more detail, give a brief overview of what we're doing in general in our lab. So there are plenty of models of collective behavior, of collective movement in literature. You, maybe some of you have heard of the famous Vichek model or the three zone models. So these models are typically referred to as social force models. Um, and they typically assume that you have something like binary force-like interactions between agents, which could be repulsion, attraction, um, alignment so that you coordinate your directions of motion. Um, however, what the, these uh, simple models typically neglect is the actual perception at the level of individuals. And this is something that bugged me for a long time, and this is one main um, activity of our lab to actually develop new models uh, of collective movement, which take uh, the limitations, potential limitations of perception and maybe even cognition into account but still with the bottom-up approach, uh, really taking the physics approach to this, but really thinking about how can we bring perception into a physical way of thinking. And one very recent paper that I'm pretty excited about in this direction is uh, with Renaud Bastien, which just appeared in the beginning of this year, where we really take uh, a bunch of agents, self-propelled uh, agents that move in a, let's for the beginning in a two-dimensional plane, and they, they have only interact through vision. So basically, 
they can only see what is projected in the retina. And in a simple case, it's shown here, on, depicted on this um, graph, is uh, you can imagine that they have the simplest possible vision um, that it's basically black and white. So if there's something, it's black. If there's nothing, it's white. And there's might be even no um, object recognition. So even you cannot distinguish whether it's a one individual close by or two or three individual um, overlapping because of occlusions. And the question is, you know, is this enough to generate, um, for example, coordinated movement? And in this paper, we actually started from bottom up, um, writing down like a mathematical framework, how this vision-based model could, can work and how agents can um, uh, adjust the movement based only on the pure minimal visual input uh, by this visual field as depicted below in a simple case. And just to give you some examples of this paper, here this is just one example how such a bunch of agents, uh, this is I think 40 agents here, can effectively just paying attention to this intermediate um, or, or this immediate visual input, how they can effectively coordinate and eventually start to move in a very coherent, coordinated fashion. So you should remember that each agent just pays to the place attention to the basically black white input on the retina on its kind of uh, what it perceives. So there's no concept of distance. There's no concept of other object or other agents. It just sees this black white swirling pattern on its retina and tries to respond to that. And eventually, if all agents do the same, they uh, can effectively coordinate the motion. And here we actually looked for very, very simple uh, or the simplest possible rules that allow for such a visual uh, flocking. Another um, just parameter uh, regime gives you a different dynamic, like for example, this kind of disordered swarm dynamics that might remind you maybe of mosquito swarms. And you know, it still remains cohesive. Maybe it's not as um, on the first glance, not as impressive as this coordinated movement. But when you pay attention to this, and I hope kind of visible in this movie already is that there are almost, or there are basically no collisions despite this very chaotic nature um, of the swarming motion. But the agents still with this very limited visual perception are almost perfect at avoiding collisions. And this is something if you work with social force models, not trivial at all, if you want to think, uh, if you really want to avoid collisions that agents you know, really don't come too close. And um, here it kind of seems to work at least for this uh, uh, visual, um, pure visual flocking uh, or swarming dynamics. So this is um, a huge part of our um, research actually goes into you know, trying to develop new models um, or models that of collective behavior that take into account individual perception. But um, another big field of the research that I'm gonna talk today a little bit more is actually behavioral contagion and collective decision-making in particular in FISH. Um, and as I said, I, especially in the second part of my talk, I will uh, talk more about this. Um, then there is also a bit less prominent in recent years, um, but also a huge interest of mine, uh, understanding new phases of biological active matter, um, you know, what type of macroscopic patterns and microscopic dynamics you can uh, obtain. Um, and last but not least, what I'm also interested in is coupling this uh, complex collective spatial temporal models with evolutionary dynamics and, and really see what is the consequence of potential spatial structure or spatial temporal dynamics on the evolutionary outcomes uh, in such evolutionary games. All right, but let me, after this brief overview, let me jump to the first topic that I want to talk about, which is uh, flocking in the complex environments. And in particular, something which I refer to as coordination versus environmental responsiveness trade-off. And this work has been done in together with a uh, visiting grad student, uh, Parisa Ramani, um, in collaboration with Fernando, per Fernando Peruani, who is at University of Nice, and was just um, in April published in Plus Computation Biology. So the, typically when you think of um, collective movement models, most of them happen um, or are assumed to happen in bare or empty environments. Oh, I think. Sorry. Uh, sorry, I think we. I, I don't know if it was me or your connection was lost for a while. Oh, I think it was my connection. I apologize. Uh, no, no, it's fine. Got cut. So it was cut after you were introducing the visiting grad student, uh, Parisa Ramani. Okay. 
So yeah, it was done in, uh, together with Professor Ramani and Fernando Peruano from University of Nice. Um, and this paper just got published, or this work just got published um, a few uh, months ago. And uh, one motivation for this um, study was that if you think of modeling collective behavior, but even experiment on collective behavior, a lot of this is done in simple, bare, empty environments. You, you think, for example, of fish being just an empty tank and seeing how they swim together and coordinate motion. In simulations, you even assume oftentimes periodic boundary condition just to get completely rid of any boundaries and just look at the bulk behavior in an empty environment. But this is not the situation that most animals um, that try to coordinate motion actually encounter in real um, nature, uh, in, in real ecological setting. And this was our motivation. We wanted to see how can actually agents coordinate and collectively process information um, if they're in a complex environment where on the one hand they want to pay attention to social cues, coordinate for example with other fish, but on the other hand there might be other environmental cues which might also provide some important information, for example, signal that there might be a threat or a danger so that the agent should avoid are areas, for example, around this uh, uh, structures in the environment. So um, this is our basic motivation and we developed like a simple yet generic model which tries to really see how agents can do that, in particular, when we assume that they have a finite attention capacity. So they cannot pay attention to all features, whether it's environmental or social at the same time. So the essential model setup looks like this. We have agents, um, let's think of fish, but it could be basically any agents in the complex environment. And any agent can only pay attention to K nearest objects, irrespective whether it's another agent or whether it's a structure or a cue from the environment. All agents, uh, in our case, try to coordinate their motion with the neighbors that they detect in order to move together with them uh, and flock together. They also want to avoid avoidance zones around a point like um, distraction site or danger sites that we distribute in environment, but they can only detect those danger sites if this danger site is within its K nearest objects. So again, this is the kind of limited attention capacity um, that we implement here. And in addition, there are few informed agents that actually know what is the right direction of motion, the right direction, for example, to go to food or to migrate. Um, and this will be throughout the talk always um, along the x-axis to the right. And the question is now, given this setup, what is the role of this limited attention to actually, um, for the agents to coordinate, to avoid the danger zones, but also to find the right direction of motion provided by the few informed individuals? And in order to address this question, the first and obvious thing would be just to first look at the interaction networks. So how do the agents actually interact with each other depending on this attention capacity K, how many objects they can pay attention to. And these are the social interaction networks for the agents. The agents are uh, showed in black or in red. Black are just agents socially interacting and red are agents which are within a, a danger zone, but also close enough to, a dis to, the, to the center of the danger zone that they can actually detect the, uh, this distraction site and respond to this. So these are the agents actually responding to the sites. And I should mention that once you respond to a danger site, it overrides all your social interactions. So you're not coordinating anywhere anymore with your neighbors. You're just trying to get away from uh, directly away from the center of this distraction site. So this is um, basically what is shown here for two different attention capacities. One very low attention Um, fragmented networks with low degree um, and you get this disconnected clusters basically um, which are connected within each other but there's no um, global connection between the different clusters. On the right hand side if you have high attention capacity on the other hand of you, what you basically see is a, a single giant component um, within the interaction network and there are of course some isolated individuals which uh, respond directly to the distraction sites and this is why they're then non-responding, um, not linked to, to the interaction network. I should mention that this is in fact an actually directed network. Here for simplicity, we just show the, um, um, an undirected version, but basically a uh, um, link means that there is a, either a connection from one agent or the other. It's not necessarily a bi-directional connection. 
And another thing that you should notice that these are of course dynamical. So this is just a snapshot, but in, in reality, and we will see examples of this, these networks are dynamically and they evolve over time. So the question is now, what would you predict where the system can better coordinate and better uh, collectively process information? And you know, from a simple network perspective, you would argue, well, for the better connected network on the right hand side, for example, the information provided by few informed agents can diffuse much more effectively to the entire population. Therefore, you would expect that for K-12, this is the network that um, should coordinate better or be better at uh, collective information processing. And in fact, this is what you also see for empty environments if there are no distraction sites, so completely bare, um, empty environments. And this is, as um, expected, with increasing attention capacity, with increasing parameter K, um, for all ratios of informed individuals, uh, starting from, from very, very low ratios to a fully informed system, you always get better accuracy of following the few informed agents to moving to the right in a stationary state uh, with uh, high attention capacity. So the larger the K, the better the network, the interaction network is connected on average, and the higher the accuracy, collective accuracy of the system. But surprisingly, if we now move to a, um, a situation with a complex environment or heterogeneous environment with a high density of the distraction site, the situation completely reverses. So here, actually, a better connected network leads always to a lower collective accuracy. And surprisingly, if you have a look at this graph, um, even a fully connected, um, sorry, um, even a fully informed system with K24, this is the yellow line, um, this is actually as accurate as a um, flocking system at K1 at the minimal attention capacity at only few percent of informed individuals. And the question is, why is that? I think it's much easier to actually develop intuition for that by looking at actual what happens in the real simulations. And here, this is now a simulation movie of a high attention case. So for K24, each agent can pay attention to 24 uh, other objects. And this is a high density scenario, randomly distributed distraction site with the danger zones depicted as this um, bright bluish, uh, areas around the point-like distraction site. And then we have um, um, naive and informed uh, individuals. So the informed individuals are all, always the open um, symbols and the naive individuals are the closed symbols. And the black ones are actually socially interacting, whereas the red ones are responding to the distraction sites. And in this example, there's always, or in the examples that I'm going to show, there are always 10% of informed individuals. So only one tenth of the systems knows that one should go along the x-axis to the right. And if you look at this high attention capacity, what you see if you start from random initial condition that the system very quickly starts to converge and you see this development of local flocks or, or swarms that move together in a coordinated fashion. However, um, they, they are very good at um, re responding to the environmental cues, so trying to find the free paths uh, within the environment, but they just basically move randomly and there's no global coordination or no global order for the agents moving to the right. So now if you look at the collective accuracy, how well they are actually able to follow the um, informed direction of motion. This is shown in the screen curve accuracy. It's basically oscillating around zero. So they basically uh, are randomly moving just through the free pass in the environment. So this is the why the accuracy is actually so low at high attention capacity. The agents are very much responding to the environmental cues. On the other hand, if we go to the low attention, uh, attention capacity case, K1, this is actually the smallest attention capacity, the picture changes dramatically. So here, um, initially it's also um, random initial conditions, but you see the locally agents start to coordinate again and move together. Um, however, the, they are not forming these large clusters, but rather move in little clusters of three, four agents maximum together. But eventually, if you wait a long time, you, you seem to realize that more and more agents start to move towards the right actually towards the right direction of motion. And what you actually see is that the accuracy goes almost to 0 0.9, 0 0.8 in this particular example. So the, the whole system globally is very good about following the information provided by the few informed agents. Um, and they all, in the end, basically move uh, almost perfectly along the x-axis to the right. However, as you can see is the agents seem not to care that much about, uh, about 
um, the danger sites and the um, corresponding environmental structure. And the reason for this is essentially that this low attention capacity, the attention of individual agents gets almost completely saturated by social cues because of the self-organized nature. So if you start to move with someone else, you actually end up much closer to them. You form these local dense clusters. And therefore, for a typical agent socially interacting, its attention capacity is already saturated at this low attention capacity, capacity at this low K by the social cues, and it becomes blind to the environmental feature to the distraction side. And basically, the, the system self-isolates from the environment by this very good about at coordinating at this low K. This um, effect gets even more or even more clear if you look at structured environments. And here we have a, a single circular path. The right direction of motion provided by the informed individuals still go to the right. But for this high attention capacity, um, again, the agents are pretty good about coordinating the motion, but also trying to find the free path, which is circular here. And if we wait long enough, eventually most of the agents will end up moving together in this uh, free path in the environment and only few by accident enter this uh, completely um, dangerous kind of region filled with distraction site and danger zones. So this is for the high attention capacity so they basically are able to follow the structure and environment completely and ignore the information provided by the um, informed individuals which is moved to the right. For K1 um, Again, this looks very different. Um, um, the agents just don't seem to care about the environment at all and are more or less able to work through this high density distraction side field, but they are able to um, follow the information provided by the informed agents. So essentially, because of this dynamical networks, even if you have always small clusters, but these clusters break up, fuse together, and that, therefore the on a long time scale, the information provided by the informed agents is able actually to percolate through the whole system and you see very high collective accuracy. So now you can actually quantify this and, and really look at the collective accuracy versus attention capacity. And this is now basic uh, quantified what we saw before in the simulations. You get the maximum accuracy at high, uh, low attention capacity, typically the attention capacity is of one or two. And, and then if you increase the attention capacity further, then um, the uh, collective accuracy goes down. And the different curves here are for different densities of obstacles. So the blue one, uh, the top one is for a, a, a lowest density of obstacles. And if you increase the density of optic obstacles, this maximum becomes even more pronounced. But this high collective accuracy at low attention capacity comes at the price. You basically um, become in irresponsive to the environment if you have this low attention capacity. And this is shown now here on the right hand side, this is a measure of the distraction side avoidance. And here we normalize it actually um, by a control group of solitary agents which do not socially interact, only respond to the environment. And this is the black line. So essentially collective system is much, uh, for low attention capacity, is actually much, wor much worse at responding to the environment than solitary agents. So being collective does not provide any benefits in this uh, situation, but rather actually gives you, provides only costs because you, uh, if, if it's really important for you to pay attention to, to the environment. And only above a critical attention capacity, and in this example, it's around 10, uh, you become more responsive to the environment than solitary agents. So there you can only see benefits of being collective um, uh, with respect to the response to the local environment cues. And the question is, um, you know, we believe that this coordination responsiveness trade-off is actually maybe a general, or potentially a general feature of collective information processing system, where you basically use the same, let's say, cognitive machinery to do two different tasks. So you either can coordinate with others, or you can respond to the environment. You cannot do the same if you use the same sensory machinery, if you use the same, basically, brain to So let's see. Yeah. So Pavel, we lost. Sorry. Yes. We lost. We lost you again. Okay. I'm sorry for that. Um, it seems to be an internet issue. Although I'm using uh, Ethernet cable. Um, how, when did you lose me? 
So we lost you when you were uh, like one minute ago. It was actually not very long. You were explaining this uh, this accuracy trade off. Okay, right. So did I already explain the right hand side or only the left hand side? No, no, the right hand side was already explained and the normalization and everything. It was like a very short break. Okay, so yeah. Um, so I, we are just basically wondering whether this is like a, a fundamental feature of collective information processing systems and whether this trade-off, coordination responsiveness trade-offs could be even uh, um, you know, as fundamental to the systems as a speed accuracy trade-off that um, you know, is well established. Okay, so this is maybe the first part of my talk. And before I move on to the next one, maybe there are questions to this first part. If not, I'm happy to move forward. So is there any question? I have a very quick question that maybe, uh, when you were showing these uh, composite plots with the video and, and the accuracy and the avoidance uh, as, a, as a function of time, I think the accuracy was, uh, at some point it was getting negative. It was fluctuating around, around zero, but it was becoming negative. Yes. So this is because we, as accuracy, we calculated the scalar product of the individual velocities of all agents um, with the right direction of motion, which is just basically a vector, unit vector along x. And if the average velocity of the agent actually moves sometimes in the negative x direction, then your accuracy can become negative. This okay. is different, for example, if you think rather like of an order parameter, which can go from zero to one. Um, here for this, if there's actually a, a selected direction of motion, it can also become negative. But this is just a stochastic effect, um, and it typically fluctuates around zero. Yeah, thank you. So is there any more questions before we move? Yes, yes I have a question. question. All right. Oh, uh, yes, I, I was, I was going to ask, <clears throat> how is the information actually implemented in the, in the simulation, the, the information flow? So um, the information flow is just implemented in a way that um, we have these different agents. They all obey to stochastic differential equations, and they're different force term. And the informed agents, which is, as I said, 10% uh, zero point ratio of 0 0.1 in these examples, the informed agents have an additional term which tries to align the velocity uh, with the x, uh, x um, axis. So they bias the motion slightly, not very strong, but slightly towards the x direction. So this is like an additional force that they feel. And then the only way that other agents notice uh, or, or um, you know, pay attention to this information is that they try to align with the neighbors. And some of them are informed, which tend to move towards x uh, direction. And therefore, they, they get this, through social interaction, this bias to move along the x direction. And so this is all, basically uh, social interactions and basic copying of the um, movement directions. So, so how is the, the danger, for example, the danger area modeled? So the danger area, so we try to do, do be as simple as possible. So we assumed point like um, distraction sites. And when the distraction site, which was like, um, you know, at the center of this blue zones was within the k-nearest object, then you detected this. And then it had a certain, the danger zone around this had a certain size, which was set to unity, uh, just for simplicity. And if the agent detected the distraction site and was within this danger zone, then it moved directly away. So it uh, ignored all other influences and just experienced a, a force, a repulsive force away from the uh, distraction site. So it was basically once you detected the environmental uh, uh, cue, you ignored all other forces. Actually, Let's see if we recover him. I have a certain chance to detect this. Yeah, sorry, Pavel. Uh, after you said that uh, once you detect the danger zone, uh, you neglect, you stop paying attention to all the other forces, we lost you again. Okay, so yeah, um, and then you, you just move away. But we actually did some additional um, variations of the model just to test for the robustness of our results. So for example, we increase the saliency of the distraction sites by saying if an agent is within a danger zone, so within a distance one um, to this distraction site, and it actually doesn't detect it because it's not within its canyon's objects, it still has a finite probability of detecting it because it might be just very important for them to pay attention to the environment. 
Um, and if, as long as this, this probability is not one, where they always perfectly detect the environmental cues, you always get this coordination responsiveness trade off. So, this is really robust with respect to the response to this distraction sites. As long as there's some trade off in terms of the perception of social and environmental cues. Okay, thanks. All right. Uh, so, I think we had one more question before. I don't know. No? Yeah, I was about to ask a question, but uh, it was answered in this, so thank you. Okay. Oh. All right. Um, yeah, if there are any, maybe I should mention if there are any questions which go more in deep, I'm actually happy also to reply to them, you know, in via email or maybe in another private chat if someone is interested. But of course, um, there's much more in the paper that I can discuss here within the talk. But, um, you know, if you feel, uh, if you have some urgent questions, you can always contact me after the talk at any point. Okay, but then let's move to the second part, which is rather changing the, the um, uh, topic from this very theoretical collective information processing in terms of movement coordination to collective escape response uh, and behavioral contagion in animal groups. And in particular, what I'm going to talk about is um, actually a work that we published uh, end of last year together with um, Ian Cousin and his students, um, in particular, Matt Sosna, who did the experiments on individual versus collective encoding on risk. And the basic um, dynamics of biological uh, system that we're interested in are startling, so-called startling cascade in fish schools. So here's a fish school, and sometimes individuals just get scared, and they perform this very fast um, so-called sea start or startle, uh, where they just basically jump suddenly to the side. And um, this startle response has been studied in neuroscience uh, for fish for a long time, and it's very interesting behavior, which is known to be governed by a single neuronal structure. But what is really interesting about this behavior is that it can also spread socially through a group. So basically, if spontaneously one fish just startles because it got scared maybe by, by a light reflection, then other fish may copy this behavior and also startle, and then you see this cascade spreading to the system. And actually in this um, Rosenthal paper, the first one, this is where the group of Ian Kazi actually, Ian Kazan for the first time, uh, showed this social contagion uh, dynamics in the startling cascades. The, the nice thing about the startling cascades is that they are very, this is very fast acceleration and, and you can nicely um, quantify this. It's more like neurons firing one or zero and in the tracking data, you can actually clearly, more or less clearly say, oh, this individual was startling and this individual startled a few um, uh, milliseconds after that. And using this information and this clear quantification, who was the first startler, spontaneous startler, who was the first responder, you can actually build interaction networks, which is actually, in general, very challenging for animal groups. And this is an example of such an um, interaction network from the paper by Bryn Rosenthal and Colin Toomey, where they just uh, overlaid on top of the of free swimming schools the um, interaction networks they can, that they deduced by analyzing many of such startles. So each link is actually a, a probability of an individual startling given that the corresponding um, other agent that it's connected to startles at a given time. And you can see it's, it's a you know, very complex network which depends on the local structure, but it's also very much dependent on the distance. And you, and you can summarize in general as the closer you are, the more likely you are to startle if your, agents, uh, if your neighbor startles. So if you're interested more in the details of how to um, determine these interaction networks, I definitely refer you to this nice paper by um, uh, Ian Cousins' group. What Matt Sosner did, which was a grad student in Ian Cousins' lab um, at the time when I was a postdoc in this lab, was he moved a step further. He wanted to ask what happens if you change the context, the school, the fish are actually uh, swimming in. So what happens if you can change, for example, the risk perception? How does the system respond uh, to, this, um, to this change in risk? And the great thing about fish is that there is actually a chemical agent, so-called stuff or alarm stuff, um, that can be put in the water, which can be obtained from the scales of the fish, and to other fish, this signals danger, because maybe other, another fish was injured by a predator, so if they notice the stretch stuff in the water, um, they respond very, very strongly and they get much more uh, afraid and uh, uh, perceive this as strong subjective increase of risk. 
And what Matt did was doing controlled experiment where he actually added the structure after a certain time and looked how did the structure, how did the school respond in terms, for example, of the nearest neighbor distance, but also uh, what happened to the spontaneous startling cascades that we observed just in, in these videos. And what can be seen is that if you add the Schreckstoff, after you add the Schreckstoff, the, in general, the collective response increases because you get larger uh, cascades um, uh, of a larger size um, as shown in this plot where you see the cascade size distribution. So for before alarm, um, when the fish are kind of relaxed, you see only very few um, or mostly very small cascades with one, two fish most of the time only responding. But if you add the Schreckstoff then, um, in this uh, case, you see much larger um, um, cascades with um, almost half of the fish school um, oftentimes responding. So the total fish school size was here, I think, 40 individuals. So th this is a strongly significant effect. And the question is, you know, what is the mechanism that governs this um, collective increase in uh, perceived risk? So when you think of how animal can adapt to changes in perceived risk, if you have to think of solitary individuals, um, they have only one possibility. They can increase the individual sensitivity. So they can set down their threshold and pay more attention to the environment and just be more responsive on their own. However, if you're in a group, you can have an, another possibility to adjust the collective sensitivity by modifying the network structure. So for example, that you move closer together and then a spontaneous startle cascade could actually, given that the links become stronger, propagate much farther to the system. And the question now is, um, you know, where is the fish system actually located? And this experimental setup allows us actually to really disentangle these two dimensions, to really to ask where is this natural fish system located? So is, do the fish only modify their own uh, sensitivity or really do they change the group structure or is it a combination of both effects? And what you can immediately notice from uh, analyzing the tracking data and watching at the movies of the experiment is that the network structure changes a lot in this experiment. So this is the fish school before Schreckstoff. So it's pretty relaxed and the fish are spread out through the tank and, and swim more or less in a coordinated fashion, but still uh, uh, more or less also on a global scale random, but they seem very much relaxed and the nearest neighbor distance is pretty large um, given um, what the fish could do in principle. If you add Schreckstoff, the situation changes dramatically. The fish move much closer together. So they basically um, form this much more cohesive uh, shoal and stay much closer together. And the nearest neighbor distance just drops massively within a few seconds after they uh, um, smell the Schreckstoff in the water. So we know now that the structure changes a lot, but how can we actually look into the brain, so to say, of the fish and ask, well, maybe in addition, they also change the internal threshold because they get so scared. And in order to address this question, we combine the experimental data together with uh, um, a mathematical model. And here we used a generalized contagion model, which was actually um, inspired by the Dots and Watts paper uh, for a generalized contagion model, proposed actually for more social human systems. Um, and we just, took this model and adjusted it for continuous time dynamics and, and uh, probability rates instead of the discrete time as they did in the original paper in 2004. So essentially we have a network, we have a focal agent here and there the red agents are now the active agents. So they, through their behavior, through their escape behavior, they sh send activation signals with a certain rate uh, represented by the strength of the links to the focal agent. The focal agent receives these activation signals over time, and what it does, it just integrates with the moving window the received signals so that the cumul at some point the cumulative dose increases and may hit its own threshold. And if it hits its own threshold, then the agent becomes goes from a susceptible state to an infected or active state, where it also responds with the escape response. So it's a now basically a pure network model that we map the system to. And after a while, after the, the agent becomes active, it can go back to a refractory state. Um, and for us, uh, for simplicity, we assume that this refractory state is an absorbing state just to be sure that we have only one cascade um, and uh, that we can in this way clearly analyze the size distribution of these cascades. But given that the cascades in the real system are rather rare, um, it's also a good approximation of the real biological situation. So now we have this model and we can actually parameterize this model by the experimental data. 
So what we can do is we can take the networks that we have that we can obtain from the experiment, from the tracking data for before and after track stop. So we can actually account for the change in network structure due to the change in the uh, in perceived risk. Um, and now what we can ask is, you know, what happens if we now change the um, average individual threshold? We can actually um, eliminate all the other parameters and we end up with this individual threshold to be the single free parameter in our model. And now we can simulate this uh, contagion process on the experimentally obtained network for before and after. And this is one example of a, of a real fish network. And if we have now a high average threshold, um, you see what you expect. Basically, after a spontaneous startle, you have only a small cascade appearing. If you have a low average threshold, then the situation, oh, sorry, somehow my uh, presentation crashed. I will try to open it again. Okay. Maybe there's time for questions if someone wants to ask in between. Is there any question? I have a quick one, but I don't know if you will re answer it like in two seconds. In this contagion process that you are showing now in a network, yes. uh, the network is uh, stationary. It's going to also, the links are going to quibble because I guess these fish networks are dynamic, no? Yes, it's a very good question and I can answer it maybe not in two, but in five seconds. Okay. So <laughs> the startling cascades are very, very quick. They happen within less than a second. Uh -huh. And so you can assume that there's a time scale separation. So even if these networks are dynamic on a, a larger time scale, you can assume that in the beginning of the starting cascades, it's essentially almost like a fixed network. And this is the fundamental assumption that we do that, you know, basically what determines the size of the cascade is the network at the onset of the cascade. It's not true for very large cascades, but it's a reasonable approximation, which seems to work pretty well in terms of predictions. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, and let me share now again the talk. I hope it works. Okay. Yeah, it's perfect. So now for low average threshold, um, which when each individual gets much more responsive, then again, you see what you, what you expect is that instead of this localized cascades, you get basically a whole system firing up. So you basically get a, a full cascade, a global cascade, and basically every individual in the network responds. And now we can ask, you know, given that we know what the experimental cascade size distribution is, we can do some maximum likelihood fitting and see which um, threshold actually explains the cascades before and which threshold explains the uh, cascades for the after networks. So in a way to account, we know how the networks change from experimental data. We now know what changes in the brain, but now through this combination of the modeling where we can freely change the threshold parameter, we can see which um, values of the threshold parameter for the before and after condition match best the observed experimental cascades. And to our surprise, what came out is basically that the individual uh, threshold don't have to change at all. But effectively, this is shown here on the top one, um, the average dose threshold is the same uh, predicted by the model uh, from the maximum likelihood for the before and after conditions. Um, and these are just two different experimental exposures, so um, it really doesn't matter, but it seems to be really robust. And you can actually see what, um, you know, what effects can contribute to this. So we um, the baseline is that the first um, uh, graph of the first bar on the bottom, and then if you only change the thresholds and keep the networks constant, you cannot explain the increased collective response by the increased uh, cascade size. Only if you change the structure of the network alone, then you get almost the, the, um, the or you get basically the effects that you observe in experiments, and if you do two modulations, so you change both the responsiveness, responsiveness slightly, and the spatial positioning, you get some synergy of both modulation, but it's actually much smaller than um, the adjustment of the network structure itself. So now given our two-dimensional diagram, what seems to be the case for this fish, which are the golden chinas, is that they essentially seem to, at least in this experiment, to only modify the network structure and not really modify the internal um, thresholds. And the question is, well, you know, this is true for this fish, but is it true maybe for other natural um, collectives or maybe other natural collectives do this differently? 
What about artificial collectors as we think of, for example, swarm robotic applications? Um, you know, can we maybe exploit these two different dimensions in a different way? And one important question is, of course, what about real world behavior? Because again, this was something that happened in the lab under artificial uh, lab condition, maybe it's different for the fish in the wild. And this brings me to the very last part, um, uh, the few last slides, which is more like an, of an outlook of ongoing research, where we actually look at this behavioral contagion processes in the wild. And in particular, we look at so-called um, giant escape cascades in sulfur mollies, which is a species of fish that lives in the very special conditions in central Mexico. And they leave, live in um, Los Azufres, which is a spe special bassin or special ecological setting in sulfuric um, river system, which contains a high um, concentration of uh, sulfur um, hydrogen um, in, uh, in the water, which is typically um, toxic to most or to all living beings. But this fish actually developed a specific uh, evolutionary, uh, the specific capability to survive in this toxic uh, sulfur containing water. And the reason they want to live in this environment is because they can feed on sulfuric bacteria that thrive in this environment, so they have plenty of food. And, and so that's the reason why it adapted to live in this environment and they can live at very, very high densities. However, they pay a price for that. Uh, because of the sulfur in the water, basically there's no oxygen in the water column because it immediately um, uh, reacts uh, with the sulfur uh, hydrogen. And therefore, if they want to breathe, they have to stay, most of the time, these fish have to stay at the surface to do so-called surface respiration. And this is uh, some snapshots from the field site where we do our field research. So this is uh, in the bottom left, a picture just taken from underwater, uh, showing upwards. And all this fish that you see here in the, nicely aligned in the stream are actually at the surface. And this is um, another close up. So this is a really natural setting. And this is, the fish are very small. But being in the surface that makes them very vulnerable to uh, bird predators. So there are no underwater predators because no other fish can survive in this environment. But of course, being in the surface makes this fish a very prime target for um, bird predators. And this is just a bunch of predators that hunt for this fish. And what is interesting is that these fish seem to develop a very peculiar collective response um, to these bird attacks, which typically happen that, uh, for example, a kingfisher, this uh, black white uh, bird here at the top uh, flies in basically dives down pick, picks one fish up and then moves off and you can simulate this by shooting projectiles into the water and they basically very much resemble the response that you observe very much resembles the bird attack and if you do this and this is now a perspective corrected video of such a projectile that we shoot in into the uh, water then you see uh, this this collective response of the fish so here, when we start the movie, you see the impact and there are little ripple waves spreading out of this. But then you see these additional waves, surface perturbation spreading through the system. And this is actually a startling response of thousands of fish in this um, open field system. So the length scale here is 10 meters. So you see actually tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of fish responding in this collective manner. So it seems to be boiling a little bit immediately after impact, it seems to come down. But then again, there's a big wave and the second big wave uh, triggering. And when I saw this immediately, I, I thought, well, that looks like you know, uh, excitable media or, or stochastically driven excitable media. And it's very much resembles some things that you might even see in, in uh, neuronal cultures or certain chemical reactions that are noise driven. So I was very much excited by this. You know, how are these waves produced? Again, this is a startle response. However, it's slightly different than in the lab. They don't do this in the surface. But what they do is a collective diving response. So essentially the fish, when they respond like this, they collectively dive down. And what you see in the surface uh, videos is actually the splash that they're generating by uh, suddenly diving down with the startle response. And we can actually use this type of surface videos to quantify the uh, macroscopic activity. And this is just one example uh, where, where we can track the wave fronts uh, developing. And in this way, actually obtain statistics on the stochastic behavior of these waves. Um, and we have actually evidence So yeah, let's, let's see if we recover him again. The fish in response, so we know- so, we can Sorry, Pavel, sorry to interrupt you. We lost you when you were saying that you can uh, characterize the wave front of the stochastically driven waves. Yes, okay. 
So yeah, we can, um, I can maybe restart the video again. So, sorry for this. Now my computer is not responding. So uh, yeah, we can quantify this. We have evidence that this is actually a um, excitable noise driven system based on this analysis. We can quantify the size and the speed of these waves. Um, and for example, we can um, show that the largest waves can span up to 30 square meters uh, in area. And this means that there are, you know, even up to 100,000 of fish uh, participating in such a wave. And we can also quantify some effects. How long does this waving effect act before the system goes back to the resting state? And here there seems to be uh, that there's a, actually something like collective memory of the system for several minutes. So this en enhanced activity of the system after a bird attack or a fake bird attack uh, acts um, up to two or three minutes um, after it happens. But we can do more in the system. We can actually do even close-ups. And I apologize for the low quality, but this is actually a real field recording. So on the left hand side, um, this is a real recording of such a wave with a close up. And if you would look very closely, you can see actually uh, individual fish in there. And if I let it run, you can see in slow motion a wave spreading through the system through this surface perturbation. And what we can do now, we can actually take these videos, use, for example, convolutional neural networks to obtain the position of the fish just before the, uh, the wave spreads through. So what we can actually do, um, we can get the position and the networks in a similar way we did this in the lab for the um, starting cascades. And we can, here this is now uh, such a network that we can reconstruct it on real positions and we can run our complex contagion model on this uh, real networks to ask the question, for example, how does the uh, speed of the wave or the size of the wave uh, or the probability that the wave propagates through certain regions depend, for example, on the density of the fish and compare um, this to the actual uh, empirical uh, observations. And this is uh, something that we are currently working on. So this is work in progress, but um, we are very confident that we may get some really interesting um, results for this behavior, for this behavioral contagion in real system in the wild. And this brings me to the summary of my um, talk. So basically I gave you two parts. Um, the first part was, um, sorry, somehow my slide doesn't change. It's stuck on the video. I hope you enjoy this. Um, so yeah, basically the summary would be, um, I showed you two examples, um, two examples of our recent work. One is about, was about this coordination responsiveness trade-off in, um, collective information processing. Uh, sorry, I stopped this here and restart. And um, especially in, in the role of the limited attention capacity and, and how it may change, um, you change actually in unexpected way the collective information processing capabilities. And the second part was about this uh, behavioral contagion in fish and in particular this uh, special type of escape cascades. And what we could show in the lab is that the collective response to increased risk seems to happen almost exclusively, or at least in our experiment, exclusively through the adaptation of the collective structure, uh, through the network structure, and not through the adaptation of uh, individual sensitivity. And the question is, how general is this really for, for uh, other biological systems? And you can imagine maybe other biological systems where agents cannot that easily change their relative positions, and therefore, such a system to collectively adapt to a changing environment it would much make much more sense to change the behavior of individual nodes instead of changing the network. So we are really uh, happy and, and looking forward to, to see uh, some other examples or learn of some other examples in the nature that, where this could be the case and where we can test this hypothesis. And last but not least, I gave you a, a little bit of an outlook of what we are doing currently uh, with our field research, where we look at this large scale escape waves, which we can now study in the wild. And there, I hope we will get some first publication rather soon. So if you're interested, stay tuned. And with this, uh, thank you very much uh, for, well, I should thank all my So while we wait for uh, Pavel to come back, if, I mean, now we're going to open it for questions, you can either, uh, ask yourself or if you want to write in the chat or Spavel, we lost you when you were acknowledging the collaborators.
Okay, so not, not much missed there. I think I acknowledge also the funding agencies, so you, you see their logos. Thank you very much, Pavel. That was a, an amazing talk. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, so questions, yeah, time for questions. Yeah, can I ask something, please? Of course. Um, sure. Yes. So, um, so I seem to understand from the, the first part of the talk that when you have limited attention uh, capacity, then uh, clusters are more likely to be to be formed, you know, and then and then you and then you have this kind of directional uh, swimming. So, is this something uh, more, let's say, generic in statistical mechanics? I mean, like when you have nearest neighbor interaction or short range interaction, let's say. Um, you you're more likely to see clusters, or is it just uh, like something that you observe in your system? As, as you, have you seen it before anywhere else? So um, I think it's pretty generic for this type of flocking models with nearest neighbor interaction. Um, so the, especially if you have this low nearest neighbor interaction, uh, surprisingly, so we have actually a follow-up paper on this project, but surprisingly, not many people look at this from a statistical point of view, and we are currently finalizing a, a preprint that we hope to publish within a few weeks, that where we look at the same dynamics, not from a kind of collective information processing point of view, but rather from an active meta statistical physics point of view. And so surprisingly, people didn't look at this that much in terms of you know, what is the role of K for the spatial structures that evolve on a larger scale. So the clustering seems to be a generic feature of the scale nearest neighbor interactions. If you have another topological interaction, topological means that it doesn't really depend on distance, but only on the who is your ranked nearest neighbor, which could be a Voronoi interaction where you interact with the first shell of neighbors. This one is typically spatially balanced so that you have all, you know, through all direction neighbors. And there you don't see such a strong um, clustering. But one reason for this is also that for Voronoi, you always interact with six nearest neighbors, which is typically the, sh the, the, the first shell of neighbors in, in 2D. There has been another uh, work by the group of, I think, um, Cavagna, where they looked at spatially balanced K and N. And I think for this type of model, which is much closer to uh, Voronoi, you also would see less of clustering. But still, as long as you interact with only very few agents, or alternatively, very short range interactions, if you have metric interaction, you will see strong clustering. So for example, for a Vichic model, which is classically has um, a metric interaction, so you have a certain um, interaction range and you interact with all neighbors within this interaction range, the smaller your interaction range is um, and you have small noise, the, the stronger clustering you get, essentially. So yeah, I think it's a generic feature. And people have looked at this a little bit um, in the context of the Vichek model, not that much in the context of um, topological models like we used here, like KNN, for example. Okay, thanks. So more questions? I I do have a question. In, in the summary, and this, uh, maybe I, I missed when you were explaining it, you talk about some uh, tragedy of the commons in the sense of uh, evolutionary, a tragedy of common information in an evolutionary sense. Uh, what do you really mean by that? Yes, so uh, very well spotted. This is actually a mistake because I had a couple of slides extra <laughs> of some very Sorry. Work, <laughs> which was not part of the publication. Um, so essentially, when you think of this um, collective accuracy or collective uh, obstacle avoidance, this is a kind of a, a group fitness. You can, or you can build some kind of a group fitness from that. If you say, for example, um, coordinating or, or moving in the right direction is that beneficial for agents, but being too close to the danger zones is that costly for the agents. You can you can build from this like a fitness function. And there will be like a group fitness function. And there you can actually see, um, you can vary the parameters, the costs and benefits, and you can see these two distinct maxima. So you can either be good at coordinating or you can be good at um, avoiding obstacles. Mm -hmm. But this is still like a group selection or group fitness setting. And from a biology point of view, it would be always a question, well, does it really hold if you have the um, evolution adaptation at the level of individual agents? And this is what we did in the follow-up project with a master student of mine where she actually looked that each agent can evolve its own attention capacity 
and then see what is the um, what is the attention capacity that gets evolved. And we we um, you know tested different fitness function, but we chose one fitness function where the optimal attention capacity at the group level would be four. So something which is like a little bit in between, but it's definitely not one or two, which would be the one which is typically optimal for uh, coordination. And that will be the group optimum. And if you do the individual level um, adaptation evolution, what you realize is that this is not the evolutionary stable strategy, but the evolutionary stable strategy is again, a minimal attention capacity of K equals one. Mm -hmm. So there is actually a, a tragedy of, uh, common information, I call it strategy of common information, but it's basically the same as, as strategy of the commons. So um, as long as there are some guys providing some information about the environmental cues because they have a high attention capacity, it always pays for individuals to decrease their attention capacity evolutionary. And therefore they have always benefit, they are the free riders and eventually the evolutionary stable strategy is there where everyone is a free rider and everyone has only minimal attention capacity. And so this is what we observe in the system. However, this is not part of the paper and it's not published yet. I see, yeah, thank you. Uh, more questions for Pavel? Yeah, I guess if there are more questions which, are, which maybe someone wants to ask but not in the setting, I'm, as I said, I'm very happy to take them by email, but even also uh, mm -hmm. if possible via online chat if someone wants to talk more, um, but yeah. Um, just feel free to contact me. Thank you. Uh, so if there is no more questions, thank you again, Pavel. That was, again, I'm very, very, I really, well, we all really enjoyed your talk. Uh, thanks a lot.